Oh, of course, welcome to uh, our special guest and to everyone who is here uh, for being with us. Uh, um, uh, this is uh, uh, extended from the uh, Equality Unity at UPA with Professor uh, uh, Tanya Berge uh, and also from the Barcelona Center of Urban Studies. Um, and uh, just basically, I would like to say that, I mean, this, this, this kind of workshops, uh, 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 this is the first workshop. Uh, the, the, the plan is basically to, to be able to do this kind of workshop related to gender issues and also to sexual policies, uh, particularly in Europe uh, uh, every year. Uh, I don't know what you think, but my, my, my thinking is that uh, this is too important issue to leave it only uh, to politicians, policymakers, even the media, which oftentimes they are pretty bad uh, where, when they are uh, providing information or quality information on these on these topics. Okay, so I, I really believe that uh, 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 academia has a, a very important role uh, 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 for improving awareness, responsiveness, and of course also understanding of this kind of uh, um, current policies, gender policies, sexual policies in the European Union. Okay, and uh, the idea of the buses is basically to well to perform this role from now on in the future. And uh, we are planning to do this every year, okay? Uh, uh, of course, with different uh, guests, although you, you will be always welcome uh, anytime you want to come, okay? But looking and, and focusing on different topics. And, and also, I would like also, uh, because we have some students uh, uh, with us, uh, to, to uh, invite the students to do research on this topic. That is very important, okay? We already have a student in, in buses doing research on these topics, but, one is not enough, okay? So I think uh, these are very exciting topics, are very important uh, to, to, to spread this kind of awareness and or, or the relevance of, this, of on these issues. And particularly in the times we are living with uh, a lot of uh, uh, liberal policies and politics in some EU countries, okay? Not just outside Europe, but also inside Europe. And therefore, I think this is a great opportunity to, uh, well, to create this kind of, um, uh, awareness and also uh, uh, to provide some kind of inputs or transfer of knowledge uh, 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 into, into society. Okay. So I guess, uh, again, thank you very much, David, uh, Mike, uh, 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 Julia, and of course, Tanya, uh, for, for making possible this, this workshop, okay? All right. Should I start, Javier? Okay. All right, so. Thank you so much, both to our speakers and also to everybody who is attending. I am very excited to start this workshop. Um, so I will start uh, by saying a few words on our speakers today uh, and introducing them. So David Paternot is Associate Professor in Sociology at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. His work focuses on gender, sexuality and social movements and he has long been studying same-sex marriage as well as gay and lesbian activism uh, with a focus on transnationalization and NGOization. And since 2013, he has been researching the anti-gender movement, uh, both in Europe and beyond. And more recently, he has started to investigate knowledge politics and anti-trans politics, often in collaboration with Mike Verlo. So Mike Verlu is professor of comparative politics and inequality issues at Radboud uh, University in the Netherlands and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Her research mainly focuses on gender equality policy making in Europe and on gender mainstreaming and on intersectionality. And part of her current work centers on the relationship between democracy and gender plus equality. So on this topic, she has edited a volume called Varieties of Opposition to Gender Equality in Europe, and also co-edited a special issue together with David Paternot called The Feminist Project Under Threat in Europe. And more recently, she has been working on understanding gender regimes and on gendered uh, body politics. All right, so um, without further ado, I would let now David and Mika speak. I think we said, um, that David will start. Uh, you have approximately 30 minutes each. If that's okay, I would let you know maybe five minutes uh, before the end of your time. Um, and uh, at the end of the workshop, we will have a Q&A session. So for all of you in the audience who would like to ask a question, just you can let me know on the chat. You can either directly write the question and I can 
read it out aloud, or you can use the, the hand function, uh, <laughs> uh, the raise hand function in the chat, and I will give you uh, um, the microphone. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> So thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be here this afternoon. Actually, physically, I'm very close to you because I live partly in Barcelona. I've been stuck here since September. So I'm in the Raval, so not that far. And, and I have another event, in, Zoom event in Catalonia upon Zoom next week as well. So there are different things happening. So what I will do, uh, I've decided, I mean, I could have, um, I've decided to give really an overview of anti-gender politics in Europe and also beyond, and, and a little bit where we are now, especially because we have students and not everyone is aware of the topic. So I, I've, re I've really decided to be really informative instead of, um, trying to give a, a conceptual framework, although there will be bits about conceptual frameworks as well. So for that reason, I've also uh, included the PowerPoint. So now I think you should see it. Okay, so really uh, I've decided to start with three recent Spanish stories and, and they're not Catalan. I think for many reasons we can discuss later. So the first one we're discussing before is about the elections. Um, and you may have seen or not, because probably you're not a fan of that organization, that Asteoid, so one of these, and the, the main anti-gender organization in Spain, during the campaign in Madrid was really making a campaign both against Pablo Iglesias, which you see with the big, uh, the, the big poster in the metro in Madrid, and also in favor of, of Vox, including against uh, Ayuso, which was very interesting uh, as well. And, and so you see they do that sort of things like these voting guides where they have the different items they care about. And as you see, it's all green for Vox and it's not entirely green for the PP, which is already uh, something interesting. So recently in Spain too, or with Spanish actors outside of Spain and actually more in Latin America, you see uh, politicians from Vox, actually with the same surname, the two monasterios involved in different events uh, around anti-gender politics. So in the next days you have in Colombia, this Congreso Internacional, uh, which is an anti-abortion event, uh, where you will have uh, Lourdes Mendes Monasterio is going to speak there. And you have also other events like this, this conversation by the Political Network for Values, which is an organization invented by uh, Jaime Mayor Oreja, for those who know him. Who, uh, with one of the guests being Rocio Monasterio, so the, the leader of Vox in Madrid. So you see that apparently this topic is uh, keeping some people uh, very busy uh, within Vox. And finally, you have the final uh, debate, which is my favorite. And actually with Mika, we're working on that and, and preparing a special issue with other colleagues on uh, the turf politics and, and the varieties of turfness, is recent new coalitions in Spain, very interesting ones, against the, uh, the trans law, which is currently in their discussion. And as you may know, you have very strange coalitions in this debate. And, and here in the middle, you have this uh, Facebook event that was organized again by Asteoir, with on the one hand, Lydia Falcon, for those who don't know her, she's the founder of the Feminist Party in Spain. And uh, also Alicia Rubio, who is uh, uh, an MP from the Regional Assembly of Madrid uh, for Vox. And they, they talk together or inv invited by an organization who is also responsible for this bus, this new version of the freedom of speech bus in front of the Spanish Congress. And this is the bus that does not lie and reveals the, uh, the, the, the truth of nature about trans people. And at the same time, you have a very important mobilization creating more and more bridges with uh, the far right uh, among feminists against the trans law. Uh, mobilization that actually goes up to the uh, Socialist Party, both in Catalonia and in, in Spain. So this is just a brief overview of why uh, what's happening at the moment. And, and I was just asked to, uh, to talk about my research. I mean, I've been investigating those things since 2012, 2013, so quite a long time. And why basically, because I see that sort of stories in the press, and I don't understand them. So I just try to understand why, uh, I mean, to understand what these people are, are saying, how they do it. And, and this is actually what we're doing now with Mika about the varieties of turfness, so the anti trans feminist. It's partly because we do not understand them and we do not understand the positioning that we want to understand it better. Something else we do with Mika uh, also, and, and it was briefly mentioned uh, before the talk, is just trying to understand uh, the involvement of this actor with academic politics. 
So you may know, for instance, the, the main anti-gender organization in Poland, for instance, or Doyuris, is those days opening a new university in Poland, which is a Catholic integrist far-right university. So you see that it's another field. Again, this is the same sort of, of interest. We do not understand what's happening, something it's happening, and then we try to use the tools of our disciplines to make sense of, uh, the, of those developments. So after this long introduction, I'll first start by saying what are anti-gender campaigns. And when we, we developed and we, we proposed the, the notion of anti-gender campaigns uh, about 2015, uh, 16, it was really a descriptive term. And, and the idea what we want to insist on is that we're facing a new set of attacks uh, among ultra conservative activism. What we wanted to say is that it's not business as usual, it's something new although sometimes it involves old actors, but they've reinvented themselves. And there are at least three ways in which you see something new. The first thing is that you have a real professionalization of those groups. So they have become really professional. They, they know how to do lobbying. They know how to organize campaigns. The second thing that is important is that you have a generational shift. You have lots of young people involved in these movements. And this is also something that was surprising at the beginning. So the sociological uh, insight that uh, these people are old people and basically you just wait for them to die and then the problem will be solved is just entirely wrong. And uh, this is against what most sociologists thought uh, for, a very long, uh, for a very long time. And third element is that you have a transnationalization. You see the same arguments, the same frames, the same, even the same pictures, the same strategies across borders. And this was also something that had to be investigated. And just to give you an idea of this transnationalization, here you have some pictures of this uh, Spanish bus that has toured the world. So the, this bus invented by Asteroid Citizen Go. Uh, and, and so you see uh, the, the, the little uh, bus, the, the original bus uh, at the bottom on the right. So Frente a la Dictatura LGBT. So this was the first bus invented in Madrid and also that came to Barcelona. And then since then, the bus has traveled. It has traveled uh, in Italy. It is what you see uh, on, on the, the, the left and uh, at the top. It has been to New York for uh, the uh, UN meetings on women's rights. It has been to Santiago de Chile. It has been to France, as you see um, on the other side with Frigide Barjo in another version. It has uh, also traveled to Mexico, to Nairobi. So it's just a visual image of what we're uh, actually uh, seeing at the moment. And uh, what is important in that is that this new wave of conservative activism, and, and I will explain that in a second, really started in the 2000s, partly in Spain, actually. And it uh, traveled, it, it became very important in the 2010. And, and the key year is 2013. And why do we call them anti-gender movements? Probably is what you, you try, anti-gender campaigns. It's because, and I will explain that in a second, when you listen to, to or when you read what they're writing, they basically see gender that they call gender ideology or gender theory or genderism, depending on the countries, uh, as the matrix of what they don't like. So this is what brings everything together and explains all the reforms they don't like. It would be because of gender. And because of that, uh, and this is the reason why I said it's very descriptive, what we did is just, okay, they say they oppose gender, so we will call them anti-gender movements because this is one way to put them all together and to make visible that it is something specific and different from other sorts of conservative oppositions. So what do they say briefly? I will not go into the details, but just to give you some ideas about the key arguments. Well, the first set of argument is, is re really uh, obvious. It's about uh, nature, the family, and, and rather conservative understanding of all those things. So basically gender is an anthropological revolution. Why? I mean, here they, they refer to anthropology as uh, the Catholic church would understand it. So it's about the nature of human beings. So it's not about social anthropology, but it's, what, it's about what defines the human and what counts as a human. And for them, sex difference and sex complementarity are key to the human and also to, what, to uh, what can sustain what makes a human being. Why? Because it's about reproduction. What is the purpose of uh, the family and uh, marriage, especially it's to protect and to allow you to uh, educate your kids. And it's also what allows the, uh, the humanity, mankind to reproduce. So this is one element of why it is changing uh, humanity. And based on that, what is important is uh, that it is anchored in a certain understanding of nature. 
and you probably think that, uh, or you would probably expect them to use lots of religious references, and actually they do not, and this is not new, it has been already uh, uh, stressed by colleagues uh, for a very long time. They don't use uh, references to the Bible, which anyway would be very Protestant, not very Catholic as a way of doing things, but they uh, refer to the laws of nature in a sense that they say, actually what's happening, we know all that because it is anchored in nature and nature is obvious. What is very interesting, and, and based on that, the, we should follow the laws of nature. Based on that, they have also an argument of science, which is interesting because good science is the science that follows nature. And the other things like gender are ideologies, which is the reason why they talk about gender ideologies, because this is science that does not follow the laws of nature and tries to follow fantasies, ideological fantasies. What is even more interesting is that uh, for the most populist uh, of them, you don't need science. Common sense is enough. And, and the buzz bias theory is about that. You don't need science because everyone knows what is a man and what is a woman. It is the, the slogan on the bus. Boys have a penis, uh, uh, girls have a vagina, and there are no tricks to be played about that. It's just what it is. So common sense is really uh, enough, which is why I'm really pissed off in Barcelona when I see the posters by Podemos that they say that common sense should be a left-wing values. I think that we should explain them that common sense is a right-wing argument and a right-wing value. It's definitely not something left. But anyway, that's something else. Second set of argument is uh, the issue of conspiracy. And that's a bit less obvious. It's really about the idea that gender is a political conspiracy, is a strategy to take over power. Why and, and how? I mean, it's a, first, it's an idea that it's a coalition uniting very strange people. So you have the feminist, obviously, always. You have the gender theorist like me, or Tanya, or me. Like the, you have also the LGBTI activists. You have other groups, the globalist. Never know, never, no one really knows what who are the globalists, but it's something you find a lot. Or the secularist. So all this is together. And the idea is that you do not understand it. It looks very nice, but actually it's very dangerous. One of the tools to take power, for instance, is gender mainstreaming. Why? Because gender mainstreaming, and Mick has been uh, crucial in inventing that tool, actually. Gender mainstreaming is a tool that allows you to look into all the policies through gender. And actually, it's a, a tool for that reason that can allow you to, uh, to expand beyond uh, the, the question of equality and, and gender uh, policies. And in that, what you see is really the idea that it's a totalitarian project. Why totalitarian? For two reasons. One, because it extends to all spheres of life including especially private life. So it's the idea that the feminist motto that the private is political is actually a totalitarian because it is putting the state and putting people in looking what you're doing in the private sphere. And it's also totalitarian because it starts in schools. So it starts with kids, the idea that kids would be indoctrinated in school. So the pin parental in Spain for those who follow the Spanish news and that it extends throughout your whole life. And because of that, the people defending or opposing, uh, uh, rather opposing gender ideology are freedom fighters. They're people defending basic human rights against these dangerous gender ideologists. And the two key freedoms that they, they try to, to defend or they pretend to defend is freedom of speech. And there you have all the debate against political correctness, freedom of expression, that sort of things, and freedom of religion. And I will come back to that in a second. And therefore, they also claim to be fighting censorship. And then you have other combinations that you find, for instance, in, in Spain as well, about Marxism, cultural Marxism, the idea that they actually try to pursue the Marxist project through other means, which would be, among other things, values and, and ways of uh, and, and, and lifestyles. <laughs> And uh, they, they also often, for that reason, use authors like George Orwell, for instance. So the idea is that we live in an overall society, which is something that you find a lot in the far right, and partly because the, of that totalitarian dimension. And finally, the final key element about frames is about elites. So the, the final key idea is that it is something that is imposed by elites, malevolent elites, especially through international institutions like the UN, the Council of Europe or the EU, and is imposed on citizens. And it's obviously a frame that allows connections to populism. And I will, I will discuss briefly populism a bit later. 
And among the elites, you have uh, obviously the international elites, the cosmopolitan elites, but you also find the usual suspects from Freemasons to George Soros and the Open Society. So you have all of that in one pack. So this is a reconstruction of the key arguments. Then uh, new frames, and I will not develop them uh, in depth here. We can do that in a conversation that I have partly elaborated with uh, my colleague Neil Data. Uh, in, uh, you have five new frames articulating these discourses. One is demography, the idea of uh, the demographic winter in Europe. So the idea that you have not enough kids in Europe, so we need to do something. The idea is if you don't have enough kids, it's because you have feminist and LGBTI people, contraception, abortion, et cetera, et cetera. What is very interesting is it's easy to link that argument that was in the anti-gender discourse to other far-right arguments like great replacement which has nothing to do with gender ideology at the beginning, but you can make the connection. And people like Orban or Salvini are making that connection. Second argument is religious freedom. The idea that basically uh, all these different values go against the recognition of religious freedom because religious people have to do things they do not agree with. And religious freedom is more and more articulated in different settings as uh, a, new, uh, in, a new frame in the uh, international sphere. You may have seen that the EU has just appointed a new envoy for religious freedom. The former one was a really anti-gender uh, activist, a famous anti-gender activist from Slovakia. For that reason, the EU didn't want to renovate the thing. But after the mobilization, especially by uh, right-wing and extremely right-wing uh, people, the EU has decided to finally appoint someone. Third argument is ecology. I told you it's about nature. So basically people trying to change the nature are endangering nature. So if you care about nature, you also care about protecting nature as it was, and often designed by God. I'm not going into the details, but that move from the Vatican, from the current Pope and the former Pope, to uh, different people, for instance, opposing artificial contraception, uh, opposing trans rights in the name of nature. Fourth argument is neocolonialism. So it's really the idea that is imposed by the West or by the North upon the South, but also by Western Europe onto Eastern Europe. And it's an argument you see developed a lot in Eastern Europe, also played, for instance, by the Polish government. What, are the, what is the Polish government saying about LGBT rights? The problem is they say LGBT rights are imposed by Western Europe on a Catholic Poland. And if the Polish government wants to defend national sovereignty, they should oppose LGBT rights. Putin does exactly the same thing. And finally, you have women's rights, so the idea that we should oppose gender to protect women. And this is an argument you find also into the, in, in the entire trans debate. So this is an idea of what are the main arguments you find in these discourses. And then where does it come from and who are the actors? So you need to keep in mind it's an old story. It's absolutely not new. It's a story that is 25 years old. So last, last year we celebrated the, the anniversary of all these things. And we need to go back to two major UN conferences. Cairo 1994 on population and development. This is the big picture on the screen in the middle. And Beijing 1995, and you see Hillary Clinton there uh, on women's rights. What is important at these two events, I mean, many things happened, but two important things for all story is the recognition of sexual reproductive rights in the language of the United Nations as a concept used by the United Nations, and also the introduction of gender, although there was no definition of gender, but still gender was in uh, the, the UN language. And the Catholic Church, under John Paul II, try to oppose these developments and other things. They, they, they won on other things, but they lost on those two things. And then they try to understand what had happened in these two UN conferences. Why did they lose? And this is where they came with the, the invention of the gender ideology discourse. And actually, it comes partly from the book you see in the middle. The, this is by a US journalist connected to the Opus Dei, who was also in Beijing. And uh, she, she said basically that it happened because gender supplanted sex. And she says gender comes as a submarine. Another metaphor you find often is the metaphor of the um, Trojan horse that interestingly enough is used by many feminists in Spain like Amelia Valcarcel without understanding that actually it is anti-gender discourse. And uh, so she, she said, basically, it's because gender is much more dangerous and gender includes all these other things that people defending women uh, shouldn't like, like abortion, like lesbians and that sort of things. 
And interestingly, I mean, we know that Ratzinger read that book. We don't know exactly how the connections happened, but the Vatican started to be interested in those, uh, in, in this kind of discourse. And then what the Vatican did is basically two things from the mid nineties to the mid 2000s is using this discourse about gender as a way to understand what had happened at the, uh, the UN conferences in, in Cairo and Beijing. And secondly, they also invented a, a strategy to try to fight back. And interestingly, it's a strategy based in Gramsci. So it's really in terms of cultural hegemony, it's really about fighting in the world of ideas, the same thing that the far right is doing uh, as well, and really trying to propose another discourse about gender. And actually, my uh, original interest in this story is when I, when when it all started, in, especially in France in 2012, 2013, and then you had people, I mean, we, we had rapidly understood that the discourse came from the Catholic Church, and then you had people who, were, who had nothing to do with the Catholic Church speaking the same discourse. And then we said, but here there is something weird happening, and it was one of the concrete effects of that strategy. And all that led the Vatican to major documents like this book in the middle, this lexicon, which is a dictionary of all the things they dislike in terms of ethics. So it's a lexicon of the ambiguous and controversial terms on the family, life, and ethics questions. And so mid-2000, what you get is that the discourse, here you have a timeline, the discourse is ready. You have key documents. So this was the first phase. Then you move into uh, two, three different phases after that. Between the 2000 and uh, the 2010, you have uh, two things happening. On the one hand, you have uh, the Catholic Church spreading that way of understanding the world through Catholic uh, uh, channels. So you have lots of lectures, for instance, in uh, parishes. You have uh, books published by uh, lots of Catholic publishers, that sort of things. And you see that in many countries. Second thing you see, you have early mobilizations, early mobilizations that are really uh, announcing what will come later, but very few people uh, understood that at the time, including myself, I was working on same-sex marriage in Spain, I really did not understand what was happening. And you have four countries where you find early mobilizations in Europe, it's Spain, uh, with Zapatero, it's Croatia, it's Italy, and it's Slovenia. And you see that they're trying things, they don't have already the full set, but there are different bits and then they change. For instance, in Spain, you had the bishops uh, uh, opening the demonstrations that didn't work. The bishops disappeared in other countries. Then we move to the third phase, 2012, 2013. It's really when you have an explosion of those campaigns across Europe. And uh, we have reconstructed that 2013 was a key year. At national level, this is the, 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 the big moment of the Manif Portus in France. In Croatia, this is a conservative victory in uh, the referendum on uh, the definition of marriage in the constitution. And you have three other elements at the transnational level. At the European Parliament, this is the defeat of the Estrella report on the sexual reproductive rights and health. And the European Parliament since then is trying to, uh, to, to recover from there. There is a new report that should be adopted very soon. The Matic report is actually following up on that thing that happened almost 10 years ago. The second thing you have is the launch of the online social uh, media platform Citizen Go by the Spanish NGO I was talking about, Asteoi, and this is all run from Madrid, and now it has become a big international thing. And the third and transnational element is the first meeting of Agenda Europe in London, which is a network, a loose network of all sorts of anti-gender actors. And from there, what you see is that anti-gender campaigns are globalized. They have diversified, you have tons of different actors, and they have also become in state policies. And then for the remaining time, what I will try to do is just to, to briefly introduce you to the key actors. So the first and the most obvious actor are social movements. So you have all sorts of social movement organizations. Some are very old, others are very uh, like the anti-abortion uh, organization, some are very new. But you have a multiplication of different groups across Europe. What is interesting is that uh, they mobilize against different things, but they mobilize in the same way. You often find the same uh, frames that I've just presented. You find even the same logos, and this is something we did when we published the, the, the book on anti-gender campaigns in 2017. The my co-editor, Roman Kuhar, put uh, all the logos he could find, and you see that at the time you had only two models in Europe. You have sometimes even just the same posters translated from French into Italian or German. And what you need to understand is that these campaigns are really like a transnational kit. 
So you have different elements and depending on what you need in your country, you will take one element or another element. And what makes probably the strength of those campaigns is that they're really adaptable and they can be e easily adapted to what you need in your own country. So just to give you an idea of what they fight against, but this is just a collage of different things you find in Europe. So it looks very messy, but basically we have uh, five different clusters of, of issues. The, the oldest one is about sexual reproductive rights. So it's about abortion, contraception, but it's also against uh, uh, divorce, for instance. And divorce was attacked under Salvini in Italy. And it is currently under discussion in Poland, for instance, which is something uh, hardly uh, imaginable today. Second set of issues is about same-sex uh, uh, marriage and more broadly LGBT rights. What is interesting is that even if you do not ask for same-sex marriage, like in Italy, but you just ask for a bad civil partnership, it doesn't matter. You get, the, you get exactly the same campaign. So actually the legal content is not important in the reaction you get. And, and that's an, a key idea we'll come back in, uh, to in the conclusion. It's also about same-sex families uh, and, and more and more today it's about trans uh, people and trans rights. Third set of ideas, it's about education and school. So it's mostly about gender education sex education, so pin parental in Spain is the perfect example of, of those things. But it's also about, for instance, the right for parents to educate their kids at home, something we, we, we have seen more during the pandemic, for instance, and the right for parents to withdraw their kids from schools, for instance. Fourth set is uh, everything connected to gender. And in that case, gender is really the red flag. If you see the, uh, the gender, it is dangerous. And in that, they put gender studies, gender mainstreaming, gender violence, and this is why they oppose the Istanbul Convention. And you have heard probably about Turkey, but the situation is not better within the EU, with the idea that the Istanbul Convention is dangerous because it includes the word gender. And the final set is all rules and regulations against uh, hate speech and discrimination. And for instance, this is where you get religious freedom. The idea that these uh, regulations against, against discrimination, hate speech, run against religious freedom. And then you have these images like homo terror, for instance, or uh, this kind of LGBTQ dictatorship from Romania. I mean, these are just images uh, that you find all across Europe. Second kind of actors after social movements are a political project. And I think here it's the main idea you need to keep in mind. It's that it's not a synonym of populism, although you have many intersections. So what happens is some anti-gender activists made their way into some political parties. Not all are on the far right or the populist right. Some can be in the traditional right, like the Partido Popular in Spain, that would be an example, or Le Republica in France. And especially what you see on the, the other end is our actors who are not known for the interest in religious values or for the interest in family values, Salvini would be the perfect example, who suddenly started to speak that language and who have suddenly understood that this language can be interesting for other reasons. And there are probably two main reasons. One is to expand their constituency and to attract more voters, partly playing on the symbolic value uh, of, of those issues. And the other thing is also, I think that they can uh, renovate and expand the, uh, amplify their discourse. What I said about the connection between great replacement that has nothing to do historically with anti-gender discourse and the discourse on demographic winter. Well, it's easy to put these two things together, although originally they were not connected. And so you see lots of political actors, especially on the far right, playing with those, uh, and the populist right playing with those ideas. And I think that for them, gender is two things. Gender is the red flag, so the, the thing you wave, like with the bell in the corrida. And the second thing is that gender is a code word. So you use gender, but actually people understand lots of other things. And it's, for instance, what you see with this meme from Vox, produced by Vox itself. So you have the warrior from Vox fighting everything from the Spanish Republic to the Catalan Republic or the LGBT people and the feminists. But by using the word gender, you can actually activate all these, uh, these different things. And the final thing that is important, I think, is that no, it has become a state policy. State policy at the level of state, but also, and this would apply to Spain again, at the level of regions. And, and we see more and more the impact of these policies in Spain, uh, in, in, in Andalusia, in Murcia, or in Madrid, for instance. What is interesting here, again, is that you have anti-gender uh, activists infiltrating the state. That's happening in different countries. You have some of them uh, infiltrating parties that suddenly win elections, what happened in Italy with Salvini uh, before, 
or you have also state actors who suddenly find an interest in supporting these things, which is what happened in Hungary. Orban at some point was fed up with migrants, so he started to attack feminist and LGBT people. But it wasn't the case at the beginning. Putin did exactly the same thing. And what is interesting here is that it has an impact in national domestic policies. I was mentioning the case of, of Spain, uh, but it's also um, the case, for instance, in Hungary. The family policy of Hungary is a very good example of that. So they, they give you a lot of money if you have many kids to fight demographic winter, to make it very short. Second element is, is also important for international politics. And it's also used as a way to reinforce the state in many uh, different uh, places. Brazil is a good case, uh, Russia is a good case, and, and uh, Trump was also using that sort of things. And what you see more and more, and this has an impact for the UN, for instance, but also for the EU, is really new coalitions of actors at the international level playing this anti-agenda politics. So may, you may have seen that during the, the, the weekend, um, both um, uh, Hungary and Poland decided to ask for uh, to remove the term gender equality from the document discussed in Porto uh, uh, about the social pillar of the EU. Well, that's one of the effects of those new coalitions, including within the EU. Another effect, it is harder and harder for the EU to speak with only one voice at the UN on those issues. In that case, because of Poland, Hungary, and a few other people. And you see exactly the same thing at the UN with uh, Brazil uh, becoming a key player, especially you now that Biden won in the US. So this is a panorama of what you have. And I will just end with uh, three ideas, no, five ideas for the conclusion. And, and then Mika will go deeper into some of the arguments. The first idea, which is obvious, is that it is a transnational phenomenon. So when I started uh, to study this in 2013, 14, the French were con uh, convinced that this was happening uh, in France because France is France. And the Poles were uh, convinced that it was happening in Poland because of John Paul II and Poland and the Catholic Church and blah, blah, blah. And people in different countries were making exactly the same argument. And what we, the first thing we try to do is to show that this transnational. Obviously, it takes different flavors in different countries. And this is something that in, uh, people should investigate more. Why take certain forms rather than others? But at the same time, you have this uh, transnational uh, connection, which is actually sustained by international organizations. The second thing that is crucial is that uh, these anti-gender campaigns are not one thing. And in another lecture, I play with these ideas about the church, about political parties and states, to show the different forms that anti-gender politics are taking today. And uh, Sonia Correa, a colleague from Brazil, calls that the hydra of anti-gender. And I think she's right. This is the monster with several heads. And you need to understand that it has several heads. You cannot understand the phenomenon. You think it has only one head. Or if you say it is populism, no, it's not only populism. The Pope, uh, the current Pope is opposing populism, but he speaks anti-gender language, for instance. That's one of the complexities you need to understand. Third idea, I don't think it is a backlash. There is definitely something against uh, the rights of women and LGBT people, but it's much broader. And we need to understand that in the context of democratic backsliding in Europe. And uh, something we play with with uh, Mika, for instance, about academic freedom is to understand we shouldn't only focus on the attacks, we should also focus on what these people are trying to build and construct. And I think that the two images on the slide are about backlash. I love this cartoon from Poland. You see, basically, I mean, you, you play and today uh, you will attack sexual uh, uh, education, another day LGBT, another day you will attack vegans, another day ecology. And it's just, uh, uh, you, there is not really, it's just a bit of hazard that it falls on one issue or another. The second uh, a picture that I like a lot, it's a poster by Ilga Europe that was for the latest European elections. And interestingly, they put the picture of a protest uh, for academic freedom in Hungary. So they made the direct connection between the attacks on academic freedom in Hungary and the defense of LGBT uh, rights, saying this is about the same thing. And the final uh, thing that I think is crucial is uh, that it's really, um, I mean, I, I said elsewhere that it's a Frankenstein ideology for different reasons, not because it is monstrous. I mean, it would be too easy, but I think there are three, key, uh, three ideas that are crucial here. One thing, if you know Frankenstein, Frankenstein is the guy who invented the monster. It's not the monster. And often you have a confusion in, and I was part of that confusion in the past as well, uh, between the creature and the creator. 
between the Catholic Church and gender ideology. And no, we need to disentangle these two things. These are actually two different things. Second thing is that uh, if you know the monster is not the result of ignorance, it's the result of science. And what you need to understand is that gender ideology is not the result of ignorance. It's not because people read books that they will stop believing in gender ideology. And I think that it's a key insight we need to keep in mind as well. And the people who have invented those strategies know very well what they're doing. And the final idea, and especially not to fall into conspiracy theories, is that no, the monster lives a life on its own in a sense that uh, I don't believe first that there is one room in the Vatican where someone is organizing all these campaigns that would be far too easy. And we know that things do not happen that way. But especially, no, you have different actors who may op actually oppose each other playing and using that language and playing those strategies. And this is something we need to understand is that no anti-gender campaigns live their own life far beyond the Catholic Church. Thanks a lot. I've talked enough and know the floor. Thank too. you, David. All right, Mika, if um, yeah, yeah, you want to. Yeah. Yes, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Um, so I will I will continue and uh, to I don't know trigger the imagination of all you attendants here and all the students. I think I will dive into a very unlikely case, which is the country where I live. No, it's not the country where I'm from. Doesn't matter. Uh, it's the country where I live. It's the Netherlands, and uh, I'm going to look into the Netherlands to see whether some of these claims that David has been arguing for, like it's transnational, um, if we can find evidence of that. Because if we can find it in the Netherlands, it's a strong uh, case to be made. And maybe also, if we look into a country like the Netherlands, we can see something different. And that can also uh, teach us something. So I'm going to try to engage you in this, in this uh, uh, journey through the Netherlands and through what we know about the Netherlands to let you imagine that maybe you can go study it in some other place as well or in some other period or connected to some other actors or connected to some other understandings of what it all is. So the Netherlands, of course, is an unlikely case. Why? Because it's seen as a champion of gender equality, of sexual equality. And it has a very good reputation in that sense. Of course, this is a reputation. So seen from inside the Netherlands, it doesn't look all that rosy. And um, for instance, we hardly have any gender equality policies left since a long time. We have been accused of torturing intersex infants by the UN and the government is uh, refusing to do anything about that. And we only um, abolished this um, awful law that trans people needed to destroy their reproductive capacities before they could transition uh, two years ago or something. So we have an excellent reputation, but it's not on, only what's happening. But still many things are uh, kind of better than in other countries in the Netherlands. And, um, no, and in, in terms of what is not right, 50 to 60% of women in the Netherlands are not economically independent. They could not survive on their own income. So it's not just like, let's say the um, such type of issues, it's also economic issues. So if we look into the Netherlands, maybe we can find forms of anti-gender mobilizations or sentiments or actions that clarify the roots of this or the different forms that it takes or the early beginnings of it or other formats or other actors. And we can maybe find evidence of this transnationalization or generational uh, shifts. So what do we see? So I will do four things then to look at what we see. First, I will look at parties and parliamentary politics. Um, and about that, I have written an article in politics and governance in the special issue that was mentioned already, and that's open access, so you can all read it if you want. Then I will also look at um, the followers of those far-right countries that uh, are the subject of my investigation in that article, because there's a recent uh, analysis of this by uh, 
Fiers and Perut Fiers and Jasper Mais in the European Journal of Gender and Politics. Then I will look at one specific topic, which is abortion rights in the Netherlands. And um, then I will also have a specific look at international alliances that are relevant to strengthening or supporting anti-gender uh, actors. So um, this is the four elements that I will uh, go through. And uh, this is also good for Julia, then she can see whether I'm at point four and whether I'm reaching some kind of conclusion, right? So the two parties that I investigated to, to have uh, an idea of what they uh, did in, in Dutch uh, politics on, on gender and sexuality uh, are the PVV, which is Wilders Party, the Party for Freedom, and Thierry Baudet's party of the Forum for Democracy. Um, since the last elections this year, the PVV has gone down from 20 seats in parliament to 17 seats, which makes it one of the biggest parties. You know, we have this proportional representation without any thresholds, so uh, we have a large amount of parties. And the Forum for Democracy of Thierry Baudet that came into parliament uh, with the previous elections with two seats now has seven. So um, the balance between the two is a bit shifting and it seems that Forum for Democracy is, uh, is uh, stronger. In the polls, they were even stronger, but they had so many scandals internally that they went down to seven in the actual elections. So this PVV of Wilders is good to understand that this is not a party in any classical sense. The Dutch um, organization of democracy allows parties not to be an association. So there's no limit in, Dutch, uh, in the Dutch parliamentary system for a party to have more less than one member. So Wilders is the only member of his party and therefore in total control of anything that happens with his 17 MPs, right? And before that with the 20 MPs. It also means that he doesn't have to disclose the roots of his financial um, support because he's not he's not a foundation he's not an association so he doesn't fall under such type of laws and uh, the main item on his political program is to stop the islamization of the netherlands and this this is seen as driven by mass immigration accommodation of muslim citizens through multicultural politics and um so in that bigger mission of this party against um, Muslim citizens in the Netherlands, um, equality uh, is one of the elements that is used to blame Muslim citizens uh, for not belonging in the Netherlands. So it's a classic case of female nationalism or homo nationalism as well, where the basic idea of this party in what they uh, present in parliament um, is that in the Netherlands, we have already achieved gender and sexual equality. And therefore, the only ones that are not in line with them are the Muslim citizens. And that is why they don't belong here and should go back to where they come from. Even if they're born in the Netherlands, no? the Dutch have a strange understanding of who's Dutch in that sense. Um, so the at first sight, you would think, yeah, well, this is a very racist party, but maybe on gender and sexuality, they are not against it. So I want to do an investigation of that. Um, and of course, the first element is that this phenomenon of denying inequality where it exists, I told you 50 to 60% of the Dutch women are not economically independent, that means you can hardly defend that as existing gender equality in the country. Um, if you deny that gender equality, uh, inequality exists while it is clear that it exists, this is a particular form of opposing uh, gender equality, right? So it's, it's, you could say in a certain sense, it's a softer form, but denial is a very strong form of opposing something because it means there is no further need to do anything about that. And, and when I looked at what they vote for in the parliament, which was the next thing I did, uh, you could clearly see that they vote against any gender and uh, most uh, sexual equality measures that are uh, proposed. 
because according to them, it's not needed. All these problems only exist in the Muslim population of the Netherlands, and therefore we don't need to do anything against that. We also don't need to, um, to organize education for them even, because they don't belong here. We should throw them out of the country and then the whole problem is solved. And um, that, um, that's, that's a very peculiar understanding of that, but it shows that they are definitely an agent that through this denial are opposing any further potential progress uh, on uh, gender equality. And uh, their um, opposition to these measures, if you then listen at what they say in parliament uh, about that, is very clearly positioned in this anti-elitist uh, framing. So they say things like why the politically correct elite is worrying about getting one or two more female professors or with the need for gender neutral toilets in kindergartens, Islamic mass immigration is destroyed what we achieved. So they pretend to support all this while at the same time ridiculing anything feminist or any feminist uh, position. And of course, both of these elements um, is, are, are part of that message. So both the racist content of it is part of that message, but also the ridiculing of feminism is an important element of that uh, message. And um, it's, it's, I didn't find any um, instance where they were, could be seen as an ally or something. So the only votes that they voted in favor for are votes that are connected to a very biological understanding of women. So they voted in uh, favor of access to midwife care and access to sex specific medicine. That's the only times they voted in favor of something because apparently this essentialist understanding of sex is something that they can't really blame Muslims for or something, no? And in that sense, it's then uh, going, uh, in that direction. So when you, when you look at the Forum for Democracy, it's even a bit worse because uh, Thierry Baudet started his um, visibility in the Dutch public debates by um, a, a, an op-ed in a Dutch quality newspaper critiquing the European Court of Human Rights. So he's part of that type of politicians that think that uh, human rights uh, is, is uh, something that doesn't need any defending. The European Court of Human Rights doesn't need to exist. And also the Netherlands should exit the European Union. And um, similar to the, the, for, to the Party for Freedom of Wilders, apparently in their program, sex and gender is not very prominent or it's totally a non-issue. But outside of parliament, the Forum for Democracy is very active. Uh, and they use lots of uh, newspaper interviews to directly ridicule feminism and argue against sexual equality and in favor of keeping the country white. So one of these elements that you see very clearly in the Netherlands are the racist roots of some of these anti-gender uh, campaigns. And that, um, uh, I move to the second part, Julia. <laughs> So if you look at, at the, the followers, if you look at the voters, I, I don't refer to uh, a survey. The analysis made by Ruth Fierce and Jasper Meis is an analysis of the followers of these two parties in, uh, on Facebook. So they analyzed uh, the comments made by the followers of these uh, parties. And um, so they see a type of difference between the two parties. And um, they found a very strong relationship between nativism and uh, gender and sexuality. So this particular understanding of gender and sexuality as contributing to um, the Dutch population and the nature of the Dutch population. And in the case of Forum for Democracy, there's also strong connections to this ideology of the great replacement that we are really in danger in the Netherlands of being replaced by Islamic uh, people. And, um, if they compare it and the Forum for Democracy followers more often reject uh, issues such as uh, transgender issues and diverse gender identities than the Forum for Democracy, than the uh, Party for Freedom followers. 
um, and they are more conservative um, on gender roles and on gender equality at work or in politics, ridiculing at time um, female ministers for she wouldn't have gotten here if she wasn't a feminist and a lesbian or uh, you know things like that. So um, that um, so there is two elements. No, this post-feminist standpoint comes back. Uh, time and again, we, we have this sexual and gender equality in the Netherlands. We don't need to, we don't need to pay any attention to that. The only problem with this is the Muslim uh, population of the Netherlands. And um, then within that, um, there, there is, especially among the followers of the Forum for Democracy, a strong inclination to favor more conservative understanding of of sexual sex roles and uh, to um, and this is also but that's more anecdotal evidence. Let's see what I see if I read um, interviews in newspapers with uh, people that vote for this party uh, that then are always stressing this complementarity of men and women in sexuality and. Uh, how it is more natural for women to care for uh, children and they actually like that and it shouldn't be the state that goes against that and such kind of more conservative uh, understandings. So this, um, this is what they find in their uh, research. So I go to the third point, which let's look at a specific uh, topic. No, because this is not a broad mobilization in Dutch society, although in a certain sense, if you look at the analysis among the followers of the Forum for Democracy and the Party for Freedom, that's actually a lot of people that uh, vote for them, no? Together, that's uh, 17 plus seven, that's, uh, that's, we have 150 seats in parliament. So it's, uh, it's quite a number of people that voted for them and that might be following them. But anyway, if we look at, at an issue like abortion, which is not connected so much in the people's view to uh, sexual equality or to gender equality in the sense that it has never been part of any gender equality plan. We have a quite liberal abortion law in the Netherlands, but it is not because it was part of a gender equality policy. It was a separate type of um, feminist mobilization to change that law. So I'm, I'm building on the work of Anna Mishkoska Kajeska here, which is work on progress, because for the last year she's been following the increasing opposition to abortion rights in the Netherlands. And a couple of years ago, when she tried to find money for that project, she didn't because people didn't really believe that there was such a problem in the Netherlands. But when you look at it, then it's clear that there is a growing opposition to abortion rights in the Netherlands. So for instance, the beginning of this century, 2004, we have this annual march for life, which is an anti-abortion anti uh, march, which had a couple hundred uh, people, 300. Now, since 2016, there are more than 10,000 people attending this march. This is a, a quite substantial uh, number and it's it's consistent 2017, 18, 19. Um, I don't think we had one last year. I didn't look at that. And uh, there is also more intense protests and experienced intimidation in front of Dutch abortion clinics. And therefore, in 2019, so you can see like uh, these these actions building up. Two pro-choice NGOs have initiated a project for training buddies to accompany women that seek abortion because they were intimidated in front of the abortion clinics. And uh, yeah, because of how the Dutch governance is organized, the Dutch Minister for Health, Welfare and, and Sport has told local authorities to try and establish buffer zones around these clinics, but this is their competence. So it depends a bit on, on the political position of the mayor in these in this local entities to, to do that. So there's still quite some abortion clinics where there's no such uh, buffer zone and actually there are pic picketing uh, around these um, abortion uh, clinics. Also the anti-abortion counseling 
has been state funded since 2013 because they claim you know to be a social movement it's a bit similar to to things that david uh, was uh, telling uh, you and in 2019 I too got a little anti-choice flyer, as had all the Dutch households, distributed by the Stichting Civitas Christiania, which apparently was in my city in the Netherlands. They moved just uh, a month ago, um, with apparently also considerable resources to distribute actual flyers to all addresses uh, in the Netherlands on, um, against uh, abortion. And after, and in 2017, there was um, an article in a, in a Dutch newspaper um, which accentuated that abortions are actually paid by taxpayers and they shouldn't be. So the, the opposition to abortion definitely is, um, is building up, although there is still not a lot of attention uh, for this. And um, I, I think the Netherlands for this is a good case you, because you can you can see how it is starting to build up. And um, so I will move to the last point, which is the actors. And I will start with this uh, Stichting Civitas Christiania, who is strongly connected to all these uh, Christian organizations that David has already mentioned. And um, that most probably also has uh, uh, funding from Citizen Go uh, Agenda Europe. So there is a strong, you see the effects of this transnationalization very clearly in the case of anti abortion uh, actions. And um, I think this is, um, um, there is one other element where you uh, see that. So there is not just the you, you see transnationalization along two lines. One is these Christian networks, and the other one is the far right networks. So the, if you look at the Christian networks, um, this has started, as David has uh, very clearly um, explained, from Catholic Church, but has expanded to a much wider set of Christian organizations. And in um, 2017, the Nashville Declarations, which is an anti uh, is a homophobic uh, uh, anti-sexual equality uh, statement from the US has been translated in the Netherlands, which is not that bad. I mean, everyone should translate everything, right? Uh, but it was signed by uh, hundreds of Dutch Christian pastors. It was also signed by two members of the SKP, which is one of these, the oldest party in the Dutch, uh, gov in the Dutch parliament. Um, that was set up at the beginning of Dutch democracy to uh, make sure that not all parties would have women because they were firmly against that and they uh, managed to have this prohibition on female members until five years ago uh, when they lost their funding because of that after a, a feminist uh, uh, case, judicial uh, legal case against them. Uh, so it was it was signed by two people in parliament. It was signed by several lecturers at the Free University in Amsterdam. It was signed by hundreds of Dutch Protestant pastors. And um, this is not a very innocent declaration. So it reads, we confirm, I do the English, right? Because otherwise I'm not sure that you will understand, no? If I do the Dutch translation, so I'm not gonna do that. Uh, we confirm that God intended marriage as a lifelong covenant relationship between one man and one woman within which sexuality has a place and from which children are brought. The purpose of marriage is to make the covenant love between Christ and his bride, the church, visible. We deny that God meant marriage as a homosexual, polygamous, or polyamorous relationship. We also deny that marriage is a mere human contract instead of a covenant made by God. They also say... We confirm that it is sinful to approve of homosexual uncleanness. This is a, a very interesting trope also, no? This cleanness. I mean, apparently the, the Christians are sparkling white, no? That, um, or transgenderism. Whoever approves of it deviates fundamentally from the steadfastness that can be expected of Christians and from the testimony to which they are called. 
we deny that the acceptance of homosexual uncleanness or transgenderism is a morally neutral matter about which faithful Christians may disagree among themselves. And if you look at, um, at the, um, I had a look, an, another look at this anti-abortion website, which is called stirezo.nl, which is almost the same as, as the classic Dutch organization defending abortion in the Netherlands that uh, existed until a couple of years ago, Stimezo. So it can also attract people that are looking for information on abortion. They also attack Bina Shirino. Now Bina Shirino is, is a black uh, member, young member of the Christian Union, which is a little bit more progressive Christian uh, party we have in parliament. And she had uh, made a statement in a debate uh, in favor of anti-conception because it would, de um, it would diminish the need for abortion for which he was fiercely attacked. And then also they had asked her uh, whether she was in favor of abortion. And she said, no, I'm not in favor of abortion. But of course I am in favor of abortion rights. And so this party is, is uh, uh, this, I know, this is my iPhone trying to, to intervene in this. I hope my daughter will understand that she can, you know? Um, so the, this party, you know, with the two people signing this Nashville declaration is attacking the more progressive Christian party for their positions that are slightly more progressive on abortion and, uh, and sexual and reproductive rights. And I think this is one of the, uh, so I can come to, to, to my conclusion uh, there, because you, you see that Kees van der Staaij, who is the leader of this, this old fashioned uh, party, the SKP, uh, who signed the Nashville Declaration, and, and who has a very uh, strong, uh, positive reputation in the Dutch parliament, who was one of the coalition partners of the previous government. He is also one of the people that attend the World Congress of, of Families, uh, like the one in Verona in uh, uh, a few years ago. So he's very strongly involved with this European Christian uh, political uh, movement. So definitely, I think we can see evidence of this uh, transnationalization that uh, David was talking about. And if you look at the voters for the Forum for Democracy, which are mostly young people, although mostly male, uh, we can also see that this general shift is also in evidence. So um, what else do you see? Yeah, and, and I will go back to what I first said about the Party for Freedom. It, the Dutch case also very clearly exposes the racist roots underneath all of this. This is just an integral part of these anti-gender uh, campaigns. And we see the Dutch case also the importance of particular arrangements of democracy infrastructures, such as this case that you can actually have a party that has no members, where you cannot be a totalitarian dictator within your party and apparently then have a position in a democratic parliament. So there's a lot to, uh, to further look at. So uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I would now open um, the Q&A session. Um, as I said, if somebody has a question, you can write it in the chat or just raise your hand. Otherwise I can start. I have many <laughs> questions. All right, so I start. Um, I, I am I'm really, um, I think the topic is, is really fascinating. I'm, I'm actually also um, um, started uh, my research on this uh, recently, but when you both talked actually about the, the frames that this um, anti-gender movement or anti-gender actors uh, employ, I, it remembered me a lot of the frames employed by um, 
the uh, anti-same-sex marriage movement in the US on which I did my, my PhD research. And I was wondering how far you think this transnationalization of frames uh, is, is deliberate? Like, do they, for example, in the events that they meet, I know, for example, the, the president of the National Organization for Marriage in the US, he um, co-organized, or maybe he was the main organizer of the Family Day, uh, for example, in Verona a couple of years ago. So do they, when they meet, is it like a deliberate um, discussion of, of, of strategy, you think, or is it rather, um, let's say, national different manifestation of the creature that <laughs> David was, was talking about? Um, like how, which level of organization and strategy uh, do you think we, we, we are dealing with? Okay, sh shall I start? I think you have both. I mean, first about the US. The US has always been the elephant in the room. Uh, so if you want a research topic that is crucial, I mean, we're desperately looking also with colleagues with, uh, in Latin America, because I work closely uh, on that with colleagues in Latin America to someone who studies US politics with a comparative and a transnational perspective, which is almost impossible to find. And, and often the research produced, especially on the US Christian right, is really US focused without engaging in that yes. conversation. That explains why we have been so slow to pick up what was happening in the US. So what we see, if you want to make it short, anti-gender movements, we would say it's usually Vatican discourse with US mobilization strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. And we know that some people, like the people, for instance, involved in Asteroid, have been trained in the US, in the Phoenix Institute and some other groups. We also know that people from the US came to Europe. Having said that, uh, the use of the attacks on gender itself in the US are rather new. For many years, there was nothing. So we had the same sort of arguments without the connection to gender. And mm -hmm. now we, yes. in the last two, three years, we see the connection to gender, but it came later than in Europe or Latin America for reasons I don't know. And it started with trans issues while in Europe, trans issues were not discussed until recently in the anti-gender discourse. So it's partly a different okay. strategy something that has to be investigated because I don't know the, the details. And then about the transnational strategy, you have both of it. You have a lot of emulation in the sense that they really look at each other. The French case was a very good example uh, because, I mean, as it was very unexpected, especially in France and especially for many people who don't know these organizations, they said, okay, if it works in France, it can be uh, actually uh, copied and implemented everywhere. So for instance, colleagues working on Russia showed that uh, even uh, the news in Russia uh, made a very large covering of uh, the Manif Portus in France, for instance. So that's one thing, just copying what works. Uh, but then on the other hand, you have uh, increasing transnational contacts. So if you, think, if you take the French leader, the French leader, she came to Madrid to explain how they made it. And she traveled across Europe. So you have individuals traveling and also you have organizations, transnational organizations in the making. So Mika mentioned Verona, the World Congress of Families. I was actually there with colleagues in the room. So I had the chance to see uh, uh, Salvini closer than I see you. Uh, and, and you had all these people. Lucky. Who, yeah, lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what was very interesting is, uh, I mean, the World Congress of Families is a US-Russian organization established in the 90s, but it has been growing. And it's just one example of the, the different sorts of transnational networks that have been established. And they work more and more. So we have informal networks like uh, the Agenda Europe that Mika was mentioning and I also mentioned. You have really formalized organization. I know you have different ones. So uh, uh, the World Congress of Families, one platform where they meet and it is itself made of national and transnational organization. But for instance, for political issues, you have another platform, which is uh, the political network for values, which is the thing invented by Mayor Oreja which is uh, really making politicians uh, together, politicians from Europe, Latin America, and the US. So the last meeting was in Colombia. The next one, obviously, is in Budapest. And so you have all these different things. It's just I will not make the long list of, of uh, organizations, but you have lots of them. And then something that was striking in Verona is that these people were, most of these people were just coming from the, uh, the, the UN meetings in New York, where they're more and more active. 
And then several of them were meeting again the week after in Colombia for the meeting of the Network for Political Values. So this transnational scene is very active as well. I, I used to always joke that I was part of the International Flying Feminist Circus uh, because I was at a prep conference for Beijing and at a conference for human rights and at many of these kind of uh, events. And I met the same people and I learned a lot from them. You know? So this, I think intentionality is not, is not a very productive uh, mm. uh, concept, but diffusion and mechanisms of diffusion uh, is a very productive concept. Uh, concept. And if you look at the, the Netherlands, then, you know, because Will doesn't have to disclose his finances, um, there have been people that looked at where, where might he have gotten money. So it's clear that he did a lot of speaking tours in the US with conservative organizations that heralded him as, as one of the uh, good people in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and you know, these American speeches, they can deliver, you know, lots and lots of money, $50,000 for a speech or something. So this is one element. And on the other line, when Trump uh, was still in power and he had chosen the ambassador to the Netherlands with a very ultra conservative guy, Pete Hook, this guy facilitated a fundraising uh, event for the Forum for Democracy in the embassy, which I mm -hmm. think would not be allowed, you know, in democracies, is kind of foreign. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was not against the rules anyway, because they, they denied, it was just a meeting, it was just uh, bringing uh, Thierry Boudet in contact with people uh, that wanted to hear him talk and so on and so on and so on. So, um, so there's definitely uh, mechanisms that foster diffusion and contacts and exchange of information, mm -hmm. no? because David and me are always joking that we have to write a book on exchange of bad practices. So. <laughs> one of you is doing that, maybe we don't then have to do that, no? So that was good. And I think the other elephant in the room is Russia, where it's clear that uh, Russia has uh, lots of interest in supporting the far right in Europe and, and sowing division within Europe because it, it's weakening the, the power of Europe. And this includes the World Congress, uh, the World mm -hmm. Congress families and stuff like that, but there we know even less. So uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tanya. Hi again, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering whether you have also examined the reverse science. I, I would I like very much how, how you put it, right? So you have the, the, the creature, but you also have the Dr. Frankenstein here and, and and there's systemic and, and there's a lot of effort in, in their discourse. It's not just piecemeal, throw it to the mix, whatever. So by identifying it, it can also help, you know, well, I was wondering whether that was also part of your um, research project and maybe you could share some, some of these elements that um, in responding to Javier's call at the beginning, but also have this component, right? You study this because you also want to provide tools to activists, governments, um, progressive political parties on how to uh, counteract all these strategies. Mika, do you want to go first on science? And I, can maybe, I can maybe start because I think that um, no, Julia introduced me and said that I am now also currently focusing a lot on gender body politics. No? So if in my previous work, of course, on gender equality policies and gender mainstreaming, and I, I showed that with abortion in the Netherlands, abortion is hardly ever part of a gender equality plan. If you have a, if you know a gender equality plan that talks about um, sexual and reproductive issues, you have to tell me because it's hardly ever there. First of all, because within feminism, those are very contested issues. And second, because I think instinctively or strategically, people think it will be even more difficult to get such a plan accepted. But th these type of choices have consequences. So the, a lot of the issues that the anti-gender campaigns are mobilizing on are issues about gender body politics. And formal gender politics has no answer to that because it never took a position on that. Feminism did, 
but feminism also showed the other positions, right? So um, I, I think this is this is clearly an element where you see that they they very cleverly select whatever um, whatever they can find, no? Because feminism is is a struggle about what feminism is, and I think it should always be. Is a continuing conversation about what a feminist vision, what a feminist society should look like. It's continually evolving. So for those opposing it, finding one or the other author that says one or the other thing that fits in their uh, frame is never very difficult. They will always be able to find that. And they discovered early on that reference to God, although you know I read the Nashville Declaration uh, part of it to you, um, this, this, this divine authority argument can still be found, but it's not a popular one. So then they, they rather refer to, to science and to pseudoscience. And I mean, this is already clear. If you look at books by Gabriele Kubi, they have you know systems of notes. Uh, Roman Kuhar has written a very nice article also on how they shifted from God to science as to defend their arguments. And, um, and I think for the, the same two far right parties in the Netherlands, I also looked at their understanding of the politics of knowledge, where you see that for them, so it, it's, it's, and this is also what David and me are currently finishing a piece. So it's two elements. Because of course, gender studies and science around gender and sexuality are not in favor of their positions. They try to dis claim all social science and humanities and to rebuild a social science and humanities from an ultra conservative perspective and from a perspective that would never question or criticize authoritarian uh, governments. So, so you see very clearly that this, that this is an element of it. And I think if you want to save gender, you have to also save social science and humanities. Is, is an integral part of it, because otherwise uh, there's no space left to, to criticize, to analyze, to, um, to ask questions about that. That kind of an answer, Tanya, to what you... <laughs> David, you want to add something to oh, this? I, I agree, it's just really to understand that uh, the politics of knowledge, as we have called that, because we have no better terms, is, is definitely <laughs> part of the same story. And, and it's where the, the attacks on gender studies are connected to attacks on other fields. And it's also about producing something else. And, and something I've been doing for a long time now is really reading all these books, uh, listening to them, uh, trying to understand these arguments. So I have uh, many bookshelves uh, full of these things. And I think it's crucial to understand uh, what we talk about. And just, it works. Uh, I know from a colleague, uh, an anthropologist in Spain, she was asked to review uh, a, P, uh, a project for the science agency, and it was an anti-gender project. So they're also definitely entering uh, the, the, the channels, the, the traditional channels of, of policy, of, of science policy and research. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I, thank you. Also, I, I think also for this, I think there's two things you need to do. One is of course to, um, to try and debunk this kind of attempts, but the other is also to question whether we are critical enough, whether, whether um, the, the, the proposals we advocate for or that we execute are actually scientifically sound. In, um, and I think that's not always the case. I think there, there um, but, but of course this is, uh, you know, easy targets for such opponents. Uh, if they can claim that something has been financed just because it was pro-feminist and it is actually bad science. And mm -hmm. in, in many cases, um, I think even if I look at myself in the past, I have supported proposals that were, for instance, mainly descriptive and maybe could have a better methodology, but they would deliver um, knowledge that we didn't have yet on, on how often something existed or whatever. Um, but that's not really very good science, no? 
So uh, <laughs> in that sense, we need to also continue to, to set quite high standards for ourselves, not to make our life extra difficult, but just more interesting, I think. And, um, and at the same time, um, try to, to debunk their, um, their statement upon which they think that something needs to be investigated. You know? hmm. But you can, you can just wait for it. So those of you that are there <laughs> and that are sitting in evaluation committees, be aware of it and, um, and, and do, do think about the consequences of, of certain uh, proposed projects. We will, we will try. <laughs> Uh, okay, we have two questions from Javier and Carlos. I don't know who wants to, I think Javier was first. Uh, very quickly, well, first, many thanks for the presentation. I would like to have a, one question for each. Uh, Michael, I, I'm very disappointed with the Dutch. Uh, I thought that they were actually more liberal than you were saying today. Uh, I was living there for five years, and my perception is that a long time ago it was quite a liberal country, but Apparently, things are getting worse and worse, which is very worrying. But I would like to ask you because, uh, um, um, okay, this is a, a reality in, in, in the Netherlands and also in other member states or other countries, but also we have the European uh, uh, rule of law, which uh, uh, guarantees to some extent uh, many of the rights of, uh, of uh, gender rights and also sexual minority rights and so on and so forth. So the question is, uh, uh, my question would be to what extent uh, uh, really uh, 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 this, this is a consequence of the European, uh, 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 because I have the perception that many countries, they have the, the, the feeling that they have lost this capacity to influence what they consider important domestic politics, and they cannot do it anymore. So the issue is to what extent this is a consequence of that. And uh, uh, my perception, maybe I'm wrong, but that the room uh, basically to have to do things is very limited, okay? Because I mean, uh, 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 well, I mean, uh, clearly uh, all legislation in Europe about uh, individual rights is clearly, uh, 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 well, it's over the, the national and domestic politics in many respects, okay? So I would like if you can say something about that because, uh, um, well, I, clearly, I mean, the, this is, we can see in many countries, uh, uh, anti-liberal politics uh, are regarding to, to rights, individual rights, but we have also the, the other side, which is more European uh, uh, policies, which are pretty, more, pre pretty much going into, into this direction, okay? So I would like if you can say something about this. this all this movement is a consequence of that. I don't know to what extent this is the case. And then for, for David, I would like to ask you also a couple of things. I'm quite ignorant within these topics, so maybe are very basic questions. But I mean, one is, I would like to know why, why these people call gender ideology when everything is basically about rights, individual rights. This is not ideology. This is something about values, OK? So, uh, and I have the perception with this is that basically they, they try to use this kind of uh, ambiguous ambiguity in, in, the, in the way of they frame things to manipulate, okay? And, and the, the, the issue here would be what can be done or what can be made against this guy or, or, or to what extent this is actually made because I mean, one thing that could be clearly stated is that this is not about gender ideology this is our rights I, mean, I, I, I don't I, I hear very often gender ideology but I don't I, I don't hear so often about uh, uh, rights individual rights okay so uh, uh, I would like to know something about this and also uh, David I would like you can say something about um, how relevant are the media and the institutional capacity of these anti-gender groups in Europe because maybe they have like a, I have the perception that they, they are very well connected between them. Although uh, uh, I think that my perception is that they are making an effort to become more and more influential, but clearly they are not still mainstream. So uh, uh, if you could say where they are, and also uh, 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 again, I mean, uh, groups of people who are clearly pro uh, liberal uh, or pro rights, in their rights, should, uh, we should organize ourselves as well. And to what extent, uh, uh, well, I think right now we are in this kind of uh, something in between, okay? So there is a kind of, uh, uh, there is not a, 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 like a, a <laughs> someone who is really, um, has more predominant discourse or capacity to influence public opinion. I don't know, if you could say something out, that would be great, okay? Thank you very much for, 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 uh, for your answers.
Okay, Javier, uh, I'm very sorry, of course, that you are disappointed. And uh, if ever you come to Nijmegen, and I will treat you to gorgeous dinners so that at least I uh, can make up for it or something. That goes for all of you. Um, I came from another country to the Netherlands too, uh, because of its progressive atmosphere, culture. I came in 68 uh, from Belgium, which was Flanders, which was much more, I don't know, conservative at that time, Christian, classic Christian conservative. Um, so I found a lot of freedom here. Um, and I think this Dutch uh, tolerance has been exposed later on as uh, also being a kind of indifference. So as being part of, of the results of these um, different pillars, according to which the Netherlands was organized, where the Catholics didn't interfere with what the Protestants were doing, and the Protestants weren't interfering with what the Socialists were doing, and the Socialists weren't interfering with what the Liberals were doing, and each had their own bubble and left each other in peace. So that gave a lot of freedom um, in, in the secularizing uh, 60s and, and 70s. Um, but yeah, I mean, it has never, when I, when I in, in the 70s, when I first was looking for work, I think the Netherlands was worse than Ireland at that point for women on the labor market. The Netherlands was worse than plenty other countries in terms of political participation in, in, uh, of women. So the, the progressiveness was about free sex, I think, and about the authority of anti-conception pills and, um, and about, I don't know, walking naked in public spaces or something. So, um, and to some extent also in letting homosexual people be as long as they weren't um, too obnoxious, uh, obnoxiously visible to other people. So, um, I, I think this is, I hear the same from my colleagues in Sweden always, that this reputation of Sweden, you know, yeah, it doesn't match with the actual reality in the country. Uh, and then with the European uh, rule of law, yeah, I mean, you can always attack, very easily attack um, uh, European rule of law. But of course, if you look at it, you know, at some point in the Netherlands, we had a minister that tried to have a law on sexual harassment that cabinet was falling after nine months. So she didn't get there. She went to the European Parliament. She was one of the main defenders on all, not the initiative of a European regulation on sexual harassment. Is that European? Is that Dutch? What is this, right? I mean, Europe is an interaction. European Union is an interaction of different countries. Uh, so, but of course, these anti-Europe sentiments are used for all sorts of things, but here is not, I mean, it's, sense, it's, it's used in a broader sense of the elites. So uh, to, um, because Europe is still defending some gender equality measures, right? And, and that is not what uh, they think should happen. So but I don't think that's, that's a causal uh, effect, I think. It's just opportunistic effect in a way. Okay, about ideology, I mean, the, the official term from the Vatican is gender ideology. In countries like France and, and or Slovenia, it became theory. We're not exactly sure why. And in German speaking countries, it's genderismus. Uh, so with ism in the end, like also ref referring differently to an ideology. I think, I mean, it's really what I said before. Their understanding of science, good science is following nature. And, and therefore gender is seen as an ideology because it does not follow nature. And, and it's just an ideological, an ideological project. And often if you read their books, they go back to the, uh, to the Frankfurt School, they go back to Marx and Engels, so that sort of people. So it's really the sort of, of genealogy that they draw and, and they show, I mean, in Madrid, they would definitely say it's connected to communism, uh, but they make those genealogies. Uh, what is crucial about rights is that there is no consensus that those things are rights. And this is what they contest from the beginning. They don't think that sexuality belongs to human rights. And actually this project was pursued by uh, Trump himself, by Mike Pompeo, uh, just in, in, in a few, I mean, recently. And Pompeo started a committee 
on uh, what they, they saw as the real human rights. I don't remember the, the exact title. Interestingly, that committee was chaired by one of the most prestigious lawyers in the US, Marianne Glendon from Harvard University, a law professor, but who was also the representative of the Vatican in Beijing at the Women's Rights Work, uh, Conference. So she's not whatever sort of lawyer, but she's a very recognized lawyer. And the whole, uh, the, the whole point of that committee and the report they produced was really to ask the United Nations to go back to the real human rights because their understanding is that we have been adding too many other human rights. So for them, it's definitely not about, about rights or human rights. And, 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 and this is one of the points of disagreement. And I think that this discourse might, at, at the moment, is very much protected in the EU, especially uh, thanks to the Treaty of Amsterdam. But at the same time, we have EU actors who are really attacking uh, th those, this way of seeing uh, and understanding. So it might change in the future. Uh, at the moment, it's not the case. It's not easy to change because of how the EU is designed, but it might change in the future. Uh, and, and this is what they're trying uh, in one way or another in different uh, fora. About media and institutional capacity, well, about institutional capacity, what is interesting uh, for many, many years, um, for instance, if you take Brussels and the Brussels bubbles and the NGOs, but it's also true at national level, the, the progressive actors uh, appeared as uh, much stronger than uh, the conservative actors. So at least this is the impression we had, and definitely in Brussels. And, and then suddenly, I mean, colleagues told me, oh, but actually they do the same thing as we do. And that's true. Basically, they just do lobbying as you should be doing lobbying in EU institutions. And then people uh, the, working for progressive NGOs in Brussels know, uh, bump into uh, conservative people in the queue to buy their sandwiches, but because this is how Brussels work. So they have built an institutional capacity that they had in, in the past. Often, interestingly, it's built in connection to the US. So open democracy, for instance, has revealed how uh, a lot of US money has been poured into Europe to support these organizations. And, and several of these organizations are also European branches, not all of them, of US organizations. For instance, it's not the case of Citizen Go in Spain, but it's the case of ADF, for instance, or, or the European Center for Law and Justice. About media, uh, what is interesting is it, it's harder and harder to talk of one uh, public media sphere. And, and especially today, especially with internet, we have a multiplication of different spheres of media and they produce their own media. So obviously they have the Russian media, I mean, or, or Breitbart on the US side. So that, and, and we know, for instance, in French, one of the most common, uh, the, the most read uh, media is Russia Today, is no longer Le Monde or whatever. Uh, so that's one key element. The second element is that they're producing their own media sphere. So I follow many of these. I'm a, a convinced reader of Actual. Actual is the media produced by Citizen Go Asteroid, for instance. And, and, and there are many others. Uh, and I think that the people who support them read these alternative media. And so we can no longer assume, and, and it's part of the problem, can no longer assume that everyone reads the same thing. Uh, which used to be uh, the case at some point in, in the past. And then the other thing is even more mainstream media, Le Figaro in, in, in France would be an excellent example, but the other example, I mean, ABC in, in Spain or La Razon would be the same thing, are also uh, supporting and, 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 and spreading those, uh, those, those ways of, of seeing uh, the world. So they're also, they have also access to mainstream media. So it's not only uh, French media as were well involved in this. Yeah. And if I can add to that, you see also that some of the Belgian, the Flemish um, anti-gender uh, writers are then posting op-eds in Dutch newspapers. Uh, I think in the absence of, of, of local people. Um, so there, there's a couple of, of those people that, that you know, cross borders where the language is the same. And, uh, and I think similar things you see among the Dutch language countries, uh, the, the German language countries, because that's, uh, they can easily uh, like sound like native people. So, uh, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, we have three questions. Um, we are kind of really like expanding this workshop. I don't mind, I have all day. Uh, <laughs> if it's okay for everybody, uh, I would let the last three questions. Yeah, all right. So Carlos and then Sami and then Francesco, I think, right? What's the order? Yeah. That's great, thank you very much. Um, um, 
Well, my name is Carlos Alz. I'm uh, making research on marriage equality in, uh, in UPF. I'm in the second year of my PhD. And thank you very much for your presentations. Actually, are very interesting and very useful for me to think about it. Um, I was wondering about three, three main things that uh, made me think about what, what, you, what you said. Is, uh, first, in, in various religious countries, uh, in, in Latin American countries, for instance, uh, the discourse of moralization has been uh, like a response to uh, uh, rationalization, which is has been coming from uh, the gender uh, activist, and um, and it's uh, still stronger than science. I mean, because uh, the the population is very religious, and in, in, uh, the conservatives instead of uh, making or um, building more um, uh, scientific uh, discourses, they uh, has a uh, go go through the moralization, which is much better with uh, the religious society that we have, and um, and then uh, that makes me think about the operational capacity that we usually forgot in this, and I would like to ask you about this: um, the institutional capacity of churches. I mean, the Christian churches and especially the Catholic churches, because we have every one priest in every church every Sunday and usually every day in during the week talking to uh, so many people who goes to the church and especially in these religious countries and then the operational capacity of the conservative groups against what they call the gender ideology is very is huge I mean it's very impressive in comparison to the capacity that usually activism have has in 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 these countries, at least, I'm talking about Latin American countries, but I'm not sure how it happens here in Europe. I I know that you have more resources, but I think that's that's one key point that I would like to ask you about that. And uh, the second is about the idea of um, of uh, what is the the role of judicial activists because we we were talking about rights, and I understand that there's a struggle in the police are, arena, I mean, uh, between the, mor the moralization and the moral uh, speeches and the rational speeches, which are basically the right, uh, the right speech, I mean, the right-based approach in these uh, topics. And then um, as, as, lo as, as long as we know that we need to save science, I think that in so many countries we have to save law as well. I mean, you know, because is the way how so many times we get some uh, possibilities to to gain rights. I mean, to gain equality. For instance, in the marriage equality in Latin America, what I discover is not the most of them. The countries have not approved laws. I mean, they go through judicial decisions, uh, and then that's how maybe the, there's a possibility also to uh, fight against these uh, conservative movements against. Uh, LGBT rights or gender agendas. And then uh, I, I want to ask you about this I and mean, about the, the, the relevance of judicial activism in this process uh, in terms of how to deal with these discourses anti-gender, um, anti um, what, what they call gender ideology. Thank you very much. Um, who should we have do you want to take all the questions or sure that works too that should we do that okay so Samia and then Francesco okay. thank you and it was really quite interesting presentation and I, I actually learned a lot and for me uh, being a LGBT activist from South Asia to learn about this it was quite interesting for me and my question is I think it's it's quite simple it's like uh, when we actually had the idea about welfare state, we had these policies about gender equality and give the room for gender equality and this and that. So do you think to some extent actually that policies are uh, being misinterpreted by these anti-gender uh, political movements? And like how Mika said, like uh, these people actually put this agenda, like taxpayers are paying so for this uh, abortion. So why would we pay? So what's the positioning between this welfare state and this gender equality and LGBT movements? And are we actually making rooms for this? And how, uh, how can we look from this welfare state perspective? So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, David and Miki for the presentation today. They were really interesting. Um, I have a couple of questions actually. 
I'm going to be really targeted and, and down to the point because I know it's late and we've been here for a long time. Uh, actually, I was thinking a little bit in terms of, of top down and, and bottom up in the process of anti gender movements in the sense a bottom up level, because uh, we were thinking about all the discussion of the supporters of the, of the anti gender movements. And I was really curious to see uh, while we were thinking about this, some researches about European identification and possible factors and variants um, about the European identification. I also started to think about their crossing with this participation to anti gender movements. I actually wanted to know if the literature. Miki has spoke, has quickly spoken about a project where, or a research paper where they were looking at people on Facebook, but I was wondering how much do we know about the anti-gender supporters, if there is any academic literature that has been able um, to actually identify some factors determining the participation in it. Um, on the other side, on the top-down level, um, you know, the more I hear about it, similar topics to the anti-gender movement campaign, I've heard a lot about it when we speak about populism and political science at the political level. So really, my deeper question is, are we talking about the topic of anti-gender movements as one face, as another face of populist movement? Can we actually put it inside this broader discourse and can we actually apply hypotheses or theories from populism or is it more of a separate thing? Um, and finally, perhaps this is out of curiosity being Italian, you know, <laughs> We have we have a large prominent role in this in this whole situation of the anti-gender movement. And because I know that I think it was David mostly that started the bad again as well. So it was a little bit curious about this tension in Italy, because at the same time you, you spoke about the fact that there is not a lot of religious subjects, that it's a lot about nature and such. But in Italy, there is a massive and explosive combination of this, because it is true that Salvini conveniently skips from one side to the other. Sometimes it would talk about the common sense that you mentioned. Uh, some other times it would use mm, uh, nature and the idea of science. And some other times it would actually kiss the Holy Mary and, and then go back to the Vatican. So in there, perhaps, there is more of a complicated factor. And, and one of the things that perhaps I, I, I still fail to understand if if we know there's been recent service and the church and the Vatican support Christian Catholic religion is at its minimum, at least in Italy, which has always been a stronghold. I mean, we have it so rooted in our Italian culture. We have it in so many practices and, and daily rituals, but then people don't even go to the mass anymore and they only go to church for weddings. So what I'm trying to say is, why is the church still reacting so Stubbornly, the Episcopal Italian Conference, La Conferenza Episcopale Italiana, is a massive lobbying actor in the Italian political system. And they're always trying, you know, we have the Zan Law right now for protecting LGBT rights against political, you know, attacks and violence. And why is the church so stubbornly still resisting to this old closed message instead of changing their strategy and adapting to the market, you know, because in so many other fields, the Vatican has been acting quite quite business-like, you know, they've always been trying with the merchandising, with the branding, with the, with the new message to attract new generations of believers. But in this kind of topics, on the gender topics, they still strongly resist to that. Sorry, oh, just this question and, and that's it. Thank you very much. All right, should whoever wants to start <laughs> with answering all these questions. Yeah. Well, there are many things, so it's not possible to answer everything. About the church, uh, I mean, there were several questions. I mean, there are tensions within the church. So I would say the church and religion, I mean, depends on, on, on how you look at religious discourse. A good Catholic would never refer to the Bible, and but refer to the Catholic doctrine. So if you read Vatican documents, they do not quote the Bible. They quote Pope oh, blah, blah, blah said something. The other Pope said something else. So it's another kind of producing discourse, which is not about uh, what God said, but it's how the church has understood what God would have said. Uh, so that's one thing. And, and they do that somehow. So they do that, but understand, but it's more in their internal documents because in the public discourse, it doesn't work that well. And, and then I would say, the Pope rightly says that Salvini is not a good Catholic, and, and, and Salvini, like many populists, is using uh, religion for, uh, for purposes that have not much to do with religion. Uh, and it's part of the tension, uh, because as you, as you know, I'm sure there are many tensions today between the Vatican and, and populism. 
uh, and populist. Uh, it's true in Italy, but it, is, it was also true in the US, which makes the topic very interesting because um, they all speak anti-gender discourse, but they also dislike each other and they don't want to work uh, together, which makes the issue even more interesting about what is anti-gender today. Um, so I would say, I mean, that would be about the, the religion and, and then about the religion and the religious structure. I agree. I mean, uh, something, uh, there is a literature on that and there is many things on anti-gender in the Catholic Church. So if you're interested, I mean, this is how we started actually to look at those issues before moving to other things. Um, the thing is, it's not by surprise that the Catholic Church could produce that for many reasons. And, and especially it is true. I mean, first, this is the only religion that is also a state with a seat at the, you know, uh, the United Nations, for instance. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the, um, the church has also this capacity of producing ideas. I mean, Gramsci was fascinated by the Catholic church and, and uh, with reason. Uh, so the church has also all these universities uh, able to produce ideas and then to disseminate ideas through the channels and the media and all the infrastructure it has. and and. For instance, in Spain, a, a key player has been uh, the Universidad de Navarra and, and the Opus Dei in producing and, and disseminating these ideas with a conference organized in 2011 on gender ideology uh, in Pamplona. So you have those channels and, and yes. So and then when once the Catholic Church had produced that other actors could take over. And that's about populist. Uh, I mean, it depends on, uh, man, I, I'm not a big fan of the literature on populism, which is also one I don't go into that, but I think, and Mika has presented that as well, um, not all populists are anti-gender. Some political actors who are not populists are also anti-gender. So I think it's not the same phenomena because you, you do have populists who are rather homo-nationalist or female nationalist and Salvini is fascinating because in the same speech, it can be both female nationalist, homo-nationalist and anti-gender in the same speech and it is all consistent, which makes it even more complex. So I think it's it's more useful to, I mean, there are many bridges that allows them to work together. And there is clearly an interest from uh, populist actors for anti-gender issues. But I think it's more interesting to look them at separate issues because then we can understand how they're articulated instead of thinking this is the same phenomenon. And then there are many things we cannot see. So that would be my uh, more strategic answer. And then uh, welfare state, Mika has probably more to answer, but I think this is a, a, a great question and probably deserves more uh, reflection. One issue is about trans people, you see that, uh, but who has to pay for trans surgery, for instance. And about judicial activism, this is central. I wouldn't say it is about a parliamentary road versus a judiciary road, uh, because I, I, I'm not sure at least in Europe that it makes a big difference, actually, in terms of anti-gender things. But what you see is that anti-gender actors, the US is obvious, but it's more and more in Europe, have developed legal capacity. So you have uh, law, professional lawyers in all these NGOs. One of them, ADF, does mostly strategic litigation, and especially in Strasbourg. And this is, for instance, where they play with freedom of religion. Why are they so interested with freedom of religion? Because freedom of religion is protected everywhere, or, or more or less, certainly in, in Europe and the US, and it gives them an entry into that legal system. And what we see, we see a multiplication of legal cases. Uh, for instance, this famous case in Sweden about a midwife, uh, a Catholic midwife, and, and it's really about uh, the, the right to objection and not to do certain things. So, so there's definitely a, a sphere that needs more, more investigation, as it happened in the US already long before. Okay, let me let me start on with uh, with the welfare state, no? uh, which is it, it's it's a great question. I, I hope you write something about it, no? Because it's uh, I think I want to say two things about that. One is that in terms of um, particular elements of gender equality, some of these far right parties that are anti-gender are are not anti-gender on the economic dimension. So if you read Marine Le Pen's uh, programs, I mean, I didn't read the last one, but I, I read the previous one. She's all for um, more childcare for French women, right? So they're exclusionary. Um, so they, there's all sorts of, of welfare state arrangements that align with gender equality for the French woman, right? So that's, the racist undertone takes over there. Their, their primary choice is to make sure that 
people with immigrant backgrounds cannot access these things. And their primary discourse is also that this is so expensive because all these immigrants have so many children and, and they, uh, they abuse all these kind of uh, benefits. So, but on the, so uh, some of these far right parties and Wilders is like that also, they're not on the economic dimension, they're, they're rather to the left and supporting welfare states for the native population, whatever it is that they define as the native population. So, um, but if you, if you look at it from another perspective, then also gender and sexuality issues and especially sexuality issues have never been framed in a welfare state discourse. There's no, they have been framed as recognition and not redistribution, no? And, and I mean, it's clear for everyone who has like basic primary school mathematics that of course within the gay and lesbian community, gay couples have a positive benefit of the gender wage gap, whereas lesbian couples have a negative uh, consequences of that, right? Um, so, but is that ever part of any political program? No, it isn't. Are the costs of abortion, the costs of anti-conception, uh, is that part of a welfare state discourse? It hardly ever is. Is the cost of um, um, transition part of it? It hardly ever is. So there is definitely a class bias in, in the welfare state discourse and in the uh, welfare state programming that does not take into account sexual equality, racial equality, and gender equality. And that makes it all the easier, of course, to then avoid because lesbians, gay, trans people, they pay taxes, right? So why would they not have their needs addressed by the welfare state? But that's hardly ever an argument. So the, the material dimension is severely understudied. So go for it, I would say. No? Thank you. Thank you. Sir. And, uh, and on the church, I think I, I like very much the way Sylvia Bobby looks at it, which is to, to distinguish organized religion as part of the polity. And the Vatican definitely is part of that. Um, I mean, you, you can see in their actions that this is one of the, bull, the, the main bulwarks of power that they occupy, that they are willing to defend against anything, you know, their access to, to being a quasi-state at the UN, UN uh, level. And they're having all these diplomats in all these countries that, that are uh, useful to states and then uh, allow them to... Um, to foster alliances with many states because they uh, they have organized all the Jesuit colleges in these countries where the elite of that country has been uh, educated and therefore they know all these ministers or whatever. Uh, so, and this is of course not just the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church by by eminence is the most uh, prominent example of this. So they're masquerading as a religion, as in the sense of freedom of religion, is, is of course part of the problem because they're not a religion. They are part of, they are part of the polity and they, they position themselves at the same time as part of the polity and part of civil society, which is, I mean, is impossible in, in a normal understanding of what the polity is and what civil society is. So that's, that's part of it. And then the last question on, and of course the operational capacity of churches is huge because of that, right? And, and, uh, and there's no, no legal obstacles for them to throw all these resources into these, uh, these political uh, struggles. And uh, then how much do we know about the followers? I mean, we, we should know more, right? So we need more insider analysis of these people. No, David and me are a firm uh, fan of Martina Avanza's uh, wonderful article on the anti-abortion movement in Italy, where she did ethnographic research in the anti-abortion uh, movement in uh, Italy. We need more of this because it also exposes the contradictions and contestations within those movements that we otherwise don't know. But also, so, but we do know we, we have plenty of evidence of the, the general attitudes of the population in many European countries. 
and there's just no country where 100% of the people are, are for feminist values or for sexual equality values. So the potential target of the marketing of these type of actors, you can see that in, in the attitudes among the, the general population, no? And that differs per country and that differs per generation. Uh, but, but you have the information about that is freely available through the European Social Survey, no? So, uh, so in, in that sense, uh, there is, but on the other hand, I mean, for the, for the Forum for Democracy in the Netherlands, they claim to have 35,000 members, which would make them the biggest party in the Netherlands, but we don't know if that's true because they, they managed to, to, uh, to produce extremely confusing uh, evidence about, uh, about their membership. And then, and, and I mean, of course, they throw out people in the party with scandals, and then those people have, I don't know, obscure documents about this and whatever, whatever uh, excuse they can find to not be open about that. So you, you can't send a survey to them, right? So, uh, but more, more analysis like, uh, like Pearson, uh, Fierce and Mice would be, would be great because you can easily analyze um, the, the comments on the websites or stuff like that. So, or, or the, their followers on Twitter or, or anything like that. Yeah, so I think that's more or less. And of course, on the moralization, no? This, this, this question, I think there is also a theory about uh, that says that the, the Catholic Church only got interested in these sexual and gender issues because they lost all their power in other issues, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, a last, it's their last bastion of power, which is a kind of an optimistic idea, no? Because if we can defeat that, they will have nothing left. That would be good. So. All right. Thank you. And thank you also for giving more of your time <laughs> than what was established. I guess it was a failure as a moderator. Uh, <laughs> it took so long. <laughs> but it was absolutely great, a great talk. And yes, Javier, you want to say some concluding? Well, no, thank you very much uh, <laughs> for uh, this extension of the time. Uh, I, th I think it was interesting, the discussion and also the answer. So many thanks. And of course, uh, uh, UPF, I'm, well, you, you already know Tanya, but uh, it's always you. You are very welcome anytime. And <laughs> we would like to, to, be, uh, uh, to, to have you here as soon as we can, OK? And actually, not just for a seminar, also for lectures, OK? For, for invitation for, for some guest lecture, that would be great. Because I think we should introduce these kind of topics also into into the teaching, okay? Not just uh, as uh, non-formal activities. Uh, or or uh, I think that is important. So many thanks again, and uh, and this is it. I don't know Tanya if you uh, Tanya is still there. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 I am. She's there. Uh, uh, um, I, maybe you want to say something else? Um, yeah. Well, uh, thank thanks again to the to the two speakers and and Julia and and also especially to to Javier for co-organizing this, this workshop and, and for having you as a light. We are counting on you to mainstream gender across both the master and the BA um, degrees. So, so yes, we, we have to do much more on this. See you soon. We right. take your word. Yes. We will have you at the UPF physically at some point next academic year, if possible. Hopefully yeah. I can visit. <laughs> Yeah, and then maybe also because I think it's, I would be very interested also in then hearing from, from these people that, that work on similar issues, because it's, uh, I thought the questions were just wonderful. And uh, the, the one thing that I hate about online meetings is that I, I don't learn so much. Yeah, I we mean, also can't mingle now on a coffee and I keep talking. <laughs> thing is to then hear a lot about what people are doing and uh, hear about the situations they're in and and this is what we are missing now so yes so, um, if you invite us back so so don't let us speak all the time let us listen <laughs> okay Mickey, you're already invited okay so uh, 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 as soon as we can I don't know how soon it's going to be 
Uh, I think both of you uh, will be invited for, for giving, I guess, a teaching a class in, in the BA or in master. I, I probably in the BA is better, okay, in the undergraduate. That would be good. And that would be great if you could actually do it uh, uh, personally, okay, because I think it's, it's much better. Yeah. So many, many thanks again. And well, thank you. I hope to see you soon. Thank bye -bye. you. Thanks bye. a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.